American earth was the source of our strength and the symbol of our spirit and the landscape of our aspiration. We camped upon it, moved westward through it, built on it, sustained ourselves from the earth. Until suddenly, in our own time, there was very little of it left. the American earth are paving over our inheritance. We seem intent on turning the last great forests into housing tracks and the last meadows into parking lots. That is how America the Beautiful is becoming America the Bulldozed. This land is yours and mine, and this is a broadcast about what is happening to it. For the next half hour, we will travel from the redwood forests to the Gulf Stream waters to see what the pressures of population have meant to this land which was made for you and me. Bulldozers gave us the factory sites and the suburbs and the superhighways that are the substance of our prosperity. The bulldozers helped carve a rich civilization from the sleeping earth. But that civilization grew largely without plan, and it was more wasteful and destructive of the land than any before it. Now the limit of unplanned expansion may have been reached. These are the Santa Monica Mountains, 16,000 undeveloped acres at the center of Los Angeles, California. They were proposed as a green park to relieve the urban sprawl of our most sprawling metropolis. But the bulldozers got there first. They are cutting terraced building lots where the park might have gone. Say goodbye to the Santa Monica Hills. Well, they say in San Francisco, that's too bad about Los Angeles. This is San Francisco Bay, which we are turning into a garbage dump. Landfill operations have already reduced the bay from 568 square miles of blue water to 325 miles. And there are no plans to stop the bulldozers. There are plans to send in more. Two-thirds of the bay will look like this when the bulldozers have done their work. Say goodbye to the San Francisco Bay as we have known it. 
and say goodbye to the hills above it. They have stood there across the bay, unspoiled through all of time. Now real estate developers plan to cover them with industrial plants and apartment houses. The bulldozers will soon be at work above the Golden Gate. 3,000 miles east, another bridge now spans the other great entrance to America, New York Harbor. And so now the bulldozers are at work here, too, because now there is a profit to be made by flattening the hills of Staten Island, filling in its ponds, clearing its streams, paving its surface. The borough president has sent out letters wistfully urging the developers to preserve as many trees as possible. But on Staten Island, there are many rows of new houses with only telephone poles to shade them. In these places, and in hundreds of other places, we are following the principle of business as usual. But in 1965, in the view of many thoughtful men, what is needed is business pursued in a new way that respects the American scene. I think Americans got to wake up the fact that their uh, country's getting crowded all over the land. Fairfield Osborne of New York, the founder of the Conservation Fountain. Traffic crashes, school crashes, physical crashes, junkyards. It's a hot battle. And uh, I think we'd be foolish to winning it. Look what those tourists are seeing. I want to show you something. Just a minute, and I'll show you something. See those nice people looking at New York? Look at that that they're looking at, most of the way up. Nice impression our city leaves. You can say a beautiful scene doesn't count. I don't believe that. I think people care for their environment. If the American people really want to clean up the land, they can do it. But they've got to want it. They've got to want it harder than they've got it now. You have to want beauty and open spaces and clean air. And if you don't want them hard enough, the bulldozers soon remove the choice. That's what happened in the hills of eastern Kentucky. If you follow a coal truck up the mountain roads, you will see what strip mining, the new economical way of mining coal, has meant to these hills. The land here is uh, being uh, raped. Uh, even more, it's being murdered because the uh, strip mining process uh, simply results in uh, the demolition of whole mountains. Harry Caudill, Kentuckian, author of Night Comes to the Cumberlands. The uh, mountains in some areas are being decapitated, in others they are being skinned. Uh, the desolation uh, here at this place is typical of uh, the spreading death and uh, ruin that is creeping across uh, all the Appalachian coal field. It is a despoliation that uh, beggars the imagination. To give uh, you some idea of the magnitude of this ruin, consider the fact that only a single coal company has indicated that it plans to strip mine and reduce to this situation more than 5,000 ridgeline miles of the East Kentucky land. In many parts of Eastern Kentucky, homes have been uh, destroyed. Great boulders have been dislodged and sent rolling uh, down the hills. These stones have in some instances uh, destroyed houses. And uh, this is a fairly commonplace occurrence. Uh, it will be a tragedy, almost uh, too great to measure, if uh, we have the time come when a greatly increased American population turns to this land because it needs it and finds that uh, in the meantime it has been reduced to a desert. There's nothing wrong with uh, profitable industrial operations so long as they are profitable not only to the operator but to society generally. But uh, this type of operation is profitable only to the coal man. It destroys the whole community. A pall falls over the uh, communities in which strip mining occurs. The people flee, the land dies, the water turns acid, the wells become unpotable. Uh, it is a process which murders the land. And uh, this uh, cannot be economically justified in the long run. Uh, there has been a very large net loss, and that is precisely what is happening in the hills of eastern Kentucky. The same thing may happen in these mountains, the North Cascades of Washington State. Thirty years ago, the government reported that the North Cascades would be a more beautiful national park than any we already have. Today, a generation later, they have just finished another study. 
In the meantime, in the beautiful valleys below the snow-capped peaks, it is already too late. The loggers are at work here, and the big mining companies are surveying the hillsides. Like the other hills and woodlands of which we have spoken, the North Cascades had the fatal gift of beauty. In such places, men look at trees and see board feet of lumber. Men look at valleys and see building lots. And the bulldozers and the logging roads are sure to follow. Not far from the North Cascades, a forest floats in a log pond at a sawmill of the Weyerhaeuser Company. These logs symbolize what is happening to the American land and help explain why it is happening. When they were a growing forest, they provided peace and beauty for a country which needs both. But as logs, about to become lumber, they will provide jobs, income, and wood products to a country which needs all three. Jobs, income, and products usually win the conservation arguments in America today. Weyerhaeuser's Bernard Orell, president of the American Forest Products Institute. This is a tremendously important industry. I'm not sure of its place in the total scope in the country, but it amounts to millions upon millions of jobs. It amounts to millions upon billions of dollars. And all of these logs in this pond, as representing one aspect of that very complex industry, represent the economic future. And so I say to you and to others like you and to the preservationists who are so intent upon saying that trees are beautiful and they must not be cut down, they must be cut down because they do regrow and they certainly add to the economic sinews that this country needs to be great in this world struggle in which we're engaged today. The lumber industry, quite naturally, is opposed to turning the North Cascades into a national park. Yet it's clear we need new national parks somewhere. The ones we have were unbearably crowded this summer. In Yosemite and Yellowstone and the others, more than a hundred million people escaping one another in the cities rubbed shoulders with one another in the woods. The search for leisure became an ordeal. Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall. If we don't expand our park systems, state and federal and national, if we don't define wilderness and wild rivers and set up a system to protect them, uh, we're going to find ourselves overusing them and abusing them to the extent that the very values we seek to protect are lost. In other words, we're deciding what parts of the seashore we're going to say. We're deciding uh, how many national parks there will be and where they'll be located. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the wilderness of the country, we're deciding how much of our nation we're going to leave unspoiled. I think these are the kind of big decisions that we've got to make in the next few years. And if we make the right decisions, this will affect the whole future of this country and what it'll be like for our children and theirs. Down there, you can see the decision that is being made for our children and theirs in the redwood forest along the coast of California. No forest groves in the world compare with these. Some of the trees were growing right here in the time of Charlemagne. By the time of William the Conqueror, 1066 AD, they were already strong and tall. By the time of Columbus, they were giants. They are a part of America's heritage of serenity, a gift of the land, and many have urged that they be preserved in a national park on the grounds that they are irreplaceable. But there is no Redwood National Park, and so the roar of the bulldozers is heard here, too. A freeway has already cut a wide swath through one state Redwood Park. Now the bulldozers are headed for another one, a place called Prairie Creek. Prairie Creek State Park is one of America's most remarkable places. Its great virgin trees stand on a windy bluff above the Pacific. The wild beach below the bluff is also a part of the park. It is the only place left in the world where the Olympic elk can roam their natural range between the ocean and the forest. Highway builders wanted to cut straight through the park, widening the narrow road that's there now, but conservationists at least temporarily stopped that plan with a great public outcry. Then the highway builders announced that they would make a 700-foot wide cut through one of the park's memorial groves, which presumably had been preserved forever, and route the freeway along the beach. And there's a furious fight over that idea. The conservationists want the state to follow a more costly route, around the park, through land already logged over. The highway builders can't see it. At a state legislative hearing, it became apparent that local Chamber of Commerce officials can't see it either. 
They want the freeway routed through the park because they think it will speed logging trucks to the sawmills and attract tourists to their towns. And there's a lot of people that do, do not like to walk, they do not like to hike, they do not like to do anything. They want to ride where they're going. Why do you think they build supermarkets with parking lots all over them? Because they won't even walk two blocks to the grocery store. They want to drive to it. Well, these people are entitled to see our beautiful beaches, and we have them if we can get to them. But the conservationists think 60 miles an hour is no speed at which to enjoy scenic beauty, and they're still hoping to keep the bulldozers out of the Prairie Creek Redwoods. A camper from the Midwest, looking around at the trees, hopes they succeed. I just have never seen anything so big in my life. In Ohio, we have buckeye trees, and that's about it. And no buckeye tree looks like that. Just, you, it's just so quiet. When you get out on the trails, that's, that's when you really see the trees and it's quiet and you could just look at them all the time you don't really want to come back to civilization at all the more you can preserve of this the better I I don't think that the world needs any more freeways I think you pretty soon you're just gonna end up with a bunch of roads with no place to go on them if road builders were the only threat to the redwoods the virgin redwood groves might survive but they are not <laughs> Hundred years ago, the great original redwood forest covered two million acres along the California coast. But more than two-thirds of the virgin redwood trees are gone. And within our lifetimes, at the current rate of cutting, all the rest will be gone. Except for two and a half percent of the original forest tenuously preserved in small groves. Right now, there's an argument over whether to put some of the surviving virgin redwoods into a national park. A few years from now, there will be no argument because there will be too few trees to argue over. reason why the redwood trees of California keep crashing down. Redwood makes beautiful houses and fences. It is fire resistant. It is termite proof. It does not rot or mildew. The demand for redwood lumber is enormous. And by filling the demand at a rate approaching a billion board feet a year, the lumber companies have become the largest employer along the northern California coast. The economy of that region depends upon them. Howard Libby, president of the Arcata Redwood Lumber Company. I certainly do feel that the federal government in establishing a national park would interfere with a private enterprise system in that it would take so much land off of the uh, tax rolls, would increase taxes uh, on everybody else remaining, and it would work a hardship on people who live in the timbered area where that park would be located. They undoubtedly would have to sell their homes, move elsewhere, find other kinds of jobs. Howard Libby's concern appears justified by the facts. But it is also a fact that these were jobs once. Men were paid to do this. Trees do grow back, but when the loggers come here again in 60 to 90 years to cut the lower quality second growth, the most impressive thing they find will still be the stumps of the original forest. A grove of trees which perpetuated itself for a million years can be leveled in an afternoon. Sometimes, when man changes the land, nature has a way of striking back. Just before Christmas last year, it started raining in the Redwood country. The water, at first slowly, then in a gathering rush, poured down the hillsides where Redwoods had once stood. The rush became a torrent. The torrent became a flood, the worst flood in the history of the West. At least 50 people died, 17,000 families were left homeless. Damage amounted to a billion dollars. There is great disagreement on the question of whether logging contributed to the flood damage. But whether coincidence or not, the worst of the damage was in the region where we have been busy for a century cutting down trees.
And after the flood, the bulldozers. They have been busy all year in Northern California, reopening flooded logging roads and repairing damaged sawmill sites so the cutting of redwoods can begin once more. From the redwood forest stream waters, the bulldozers do their work, and the land is changed forever. Sometimes for the better, no doubt, but often, often for the worse. This is Storm King Mountain on the Hudson. The bulldozers will soon carve part of it away for a power plant. These are the Indiana Dunes. Eight million people around Chicago could use them for recreation, but the bulldozers have flattened the best part of them for industry. This is the last unspoiled section of the Missouri River in Montana. This is the Buffalo in Arkansas. This is the Allagash in Maine. The bulldozers will soon be at work constructing dams on all three, which will drown all three forever. This is the Grand Canyon. The ages have been at work on it, said Theodore Roosevelt. Man cannot improve it, leave it as it is. But even the Grand Canyon, so spectacularly sculptured by nature, cannot any longer escape the carving blades of the bulldozers. Soon they will be moving earth and building dams that will back water into the Grand Canyon National Park. The bulldozers, by some rule that governs them, seem to aim first at the most beautiful wild places of America. And they have gone so far and changed so much that in September of 1965, it is literally true that what we save from the bulldozers now will be all that is ever saved. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. You see, the American dream was to level the wilderness. And I suppose the symbol of our power has become pretty much the bulldozer. We're in the age of the machine, but the machine must not be our master. We must be the master of the machine. We need a, a new land ethic or else we're going to be consumed not by one great disaster, but by 1,000 little brush fires all around the country that are, that are too small to uh, draw the attention of anybody except the local people, and that will be lost uh, uh, fire by fire, battle by battle, uh, until the, the whole, of, whole of America is turned into a highway, into a junkyard. This is Charles Kuralt for CBS Reports. Bulldozed America was filmed and edited by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News. <laughs>